Inside America's Boardrooms, the informational show for board members and corporate secretaries. Brought to you with knowledge partners, NASDAQ, the Center for Audit Quality, and PwC. Along with content contributors, Equilar, Meridian Compensation Partners, Wilson Sonsini Goodridge and Rosati, R.R. Donnelly, and the Society for Corporate Governance. Welcome to this edition of Inside America's Boardrooms. I'm T.K. Kerstetter, the CEO of Boardroom Resources, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the show. Today, as we do annually, we're going to talk about PwC's annual corporate director survey. This year titled, The Swinging Pendulum, Board Governance in the Age of Shareholder Empowerment. And joining me, as he usually does to recap this, is Paul DiNicola, who's the Managing Director of PwC's Governance Insights Center. Paul, welcome back. Thank you for having me, TK. Well, you guys always do a great job with the survey. It's, it's certainly the most extensive one that's done in the industry, covers the most directors. And that's probably a good place for a start. Just do a quick review of what the survey is just for our audience. Sure, uh, we did the survey uh, this past summer, summer of 2016. Um, we had uh, over 850 directors respond to the survey, so a real, real big sample size. Um, about 70% of those directors were from companies with over $1 billion in annual revenue, so uh, a group of rather large companies. Uh, if you look at the splits there, the tenure of board members was relatively even across. Uh, about 83% uh, male, 17% female, so pretty closely aligning with the yeah, gender yeah, distribution yeah. averages of public company directors. And as you mentioned, the theme of this year's um, uh, report was uh, around shareholder empowerment and what board governance looks like um, in this uh, new age where shareholders now have an unprecedented say uh, into um, how companies um, are governed um, and uh, even into issues like uh, how they allocate their capital. Yeah, uh, transparency is certainly taking a big step it seems every year. So I always am anxious to see what the highlights are of this. So. Um, I'm sure you feel the same way when the, when the results come back. So let's talk about that. What was significant to you? What were the highlights from this year's survey? Well, I think uh, there are a few of them. Um, uh, I guess two that I'll mention. One is uh, around shareholder engagement and the other is around uh, activism more generally. Um, on, the, on the engagement side, um, you know, I think we, um, we've both seen uh, overall engagement between board members uh, and investors increase over um, the last five years or so. This year, uh, more than half of the directors uh, said someone on their board other than their CEO um, has had some sort of dialogue or interaction uh, with the company's investors. So that, that shift has occurred. Um, but the question we wanted to get at was whether or not um, directors saw value in those engagements. Um, and uh, you know, one of the findings was that they continue to be a little bit skeptical of them. So um, only about one in five uh, very much think that the right uh, investor representatives were present at those dialogues. About the same number uh, think that uh, very much believe that investors were prepared um, for, uh, for the meetings. Um, and probably for me, what was most um, impactful um, is that only 18% thought that it impacted proxy voting. Um, and about the same, about 14% said that uh, it impacts investing decisions. So ultimately, um, the dialogues are occurring, um, but some board members are questioning the value uh, and their impact on, uh, on board governance. Yeah, it would be interesting to, if, to see if on the other side, the investors felt that the boards were prepared or if we would have a similar um, ratio of, of investors that said the boards weren't prepared for that. So yeah, and and what, what's what's interesting was that um, we did find that larger companies tend to have a more positive view uh, uh, of this than than smaller companies. So um, on the on the activism side, um, you know, I think you know, looking at the climate um, with you know close to two hundred billion dollars in assets under management by uh, by activist funds. Uh, a climate where you know proxy contests are more pervasive, settlements um, are up uh, involving board representation. Um, that's the climate we're in. Um, and so what we tried to gauge in the survey was how directors 
feel about the impact of activism. Um, and it's somewhat of a dichotomy. Um, we, we asked them, do you think that activists are too short-term focused, right? which is often the accusation of, uh, against activists? And resoundingly, yeah, 96% said that they are too short-term in focus. But then at the same time, we asked them, do you think that activism has compelled companies to more effectively look at their strategy, more effectively evaluate their operations, um, more effectively look at their capital allocation? And 80% said, yeah, they have. So they've had a positive impact there. And 80% also said that it's resulted in uh, improved operations at the company. So it's a, it's a, it's a give and take. It's a you know, short-term focus, but perhaps they've been good um, for our business in some ways. Um, so. Yeah, it always seems to me that, that that is the standard, that there's pushback. You know, uh, we don't want an activist on our board, but whenever an activist does get on the board, it's quick that the board recognizes the value that they bring. So Yeah, I mean, often I, I will hear from board members that um, it is not nearly as disruptive as they anticipated to have an activist on the board and that the activist actually can um, be a um, great board member and, and contribute yeah. um, uh, quite a bit. Yeah, we're, we're still both fans of boards thinking like an activist and positioning themselves so they don't have to have that experience. Yes. But um, as the research shows, it's not as uh, end of the world as some people think it is. Yep. So I have to ask you, you know, you and I always have the chance to talk about this question about whether there are board members that should be replaced on the board. And for the last 10, 12 years that I'm familiar with the question, it has always been in the third, a little higher than third range. Last year it was 39%, if I, my memory is correct. That's right. This year, uh, to that question, I guess we're again in the 30s, and and it doesn't waver. No, no. Um, I guess when we first started asking the question a few years ago, wondering whether there were aberrations in the data, but no, it's pretty consistent. Um, this year, 35% uh, believe someone on their board uh, should be replaced, um, down you know four percentage points from last year, but still, still pretty consistent. Um, what was different this year is the number one reason for why they think someone on their board should be replaced. Um, it, it was for a long time that age had diminished performance. Right. Uh, number one this year was being unprepared for meetings. So that's, that, that's a shift. Um, but ultimately, I think that's something that gets, um, uh, that gets discussed or perhaps doesn't get discussed enough um, in board self-evaluations. Yeah, and I think even when it comes out of board evaluations, I think our experience is that sometimes n nothing's done about it. Well, that's, that's, that's a key, TK. Uh, um, you know, one of, one of the questions we asked in this year's survey around board evaluations um, was whether you uh, actually did anything as a result of those self-evaluations, right? Have you, um, because self-evaluations can be a wonderful tool to identify places to improve processes, um, uh, gaps in board composition, identify an underperforming director, but if they're not followed up on, if there's no action as a result of them, um, they really become just a check the box exercise. Um, so uh, this year, less than half of directors who responded, and this is down from last year, said they actually made changes as a result of their self-evaluation, yeah. which struck me as a low number, um, if they did make a change, they were most likely to make a change around uh, their board's composition or uh, the committee membership. Um, but it did strike me as, um, as interesting that, that um, the number was down in terms of taking action as a result yeah. of self-evaluations, particularly in light of the 35% the number uh, who think someone should yeah. be replaced. Well, both of us just finished up our third investors uh, board performance review, yeah. and we heard from the investors again that board evaluations are going to get focus. They're going to receive some focus, and they don't like the fact that directors are identified with lack of contribution and people aren't stepping up and doing something about it. So yeah. I think we can both expect uh, that to be a focus in 2017. And, and what you're seeing some companies do proactively around that is begin to disclose in their proxy statement um, what the process looks like 
around the board evaluation. Um, not necessarily what the, you know, the deep granular findings of it are, but what the process the board goes through, what comes out of it, how they are going to respond um, as a result. So I think that may be a trend we see in the future in terms of what companies are disclosing and what investors are demanding to know about that board evaluation process because board composition, I think, continues to be um, uh, one of the most important topics yeah. for investors. So there is so much in this uh, report, in this uh, survey, that we don't, we couldn't possibly cover all those issues. So where does somebody um, that is interested get a copy of the uh, survey report? Sure. So um, you can download the report uh, right on our website at pwc.com. And uh, in addition to the report, there's some uh, uh, sector-specific data. So if you want to understand how uh, your sector compares to others in terms of what directors think, you can, you can download that right off pwc.com as well. Yeah, and we'll try and get that, make sure that we get that link on our site as well um, so that uh, if they come in there, there's easy access. Great. So, Paul, I appreciate, again, once again, this is our annual visit to bring everybody up to speed on the survey. I'm sure there'll be a lot more information relative to individual questions coming out from PwC over the course of the next couple months that relate to the survey, so we'll all look forward to that as well. And thank you for taking the time to come and join us and update us. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yep. And that will conclude this edition of Inside America's Boardrooms. We hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back again next week when we take another look at a critical topic that will help you be a better board member or committee member. So we'll see you then. Join us again next week for Inside America's Boardrooms. Brought to you with knowledge partners, NASDAQ, the Center for Audit Quality, and PwC. Along with content contributors, Equilar, Meridian Compensation Partners, Wilson Sonsini Goodridge and Rosati, R.R. Donnelly, and the Society for Corporate Governance.